Well, welcome everybody. Uh, we're going to get started here very shortly. Uh, thanks for taking time out of your day to participate in the Wednesdays with Whiteman. Uh, we have a special guest today, Nikki Britton. Um, she's just stepped away for just a minute. She's dealing, she's continuing to work as uh, she's getting ready to uh, present. So as you're waiting, what we would like to do is uh, have you guys take a look at this icebreaker and in the chat box, note what your school will look like when school opens this fall. And I guess I should say, if it opens this fall to um, in-person instruction. So we'll just wait a couple of minutes uh, for others to join and then we'll go ahead and get started. Okay, well, it's one o'clock, so let's go ahead and get started. My name is George Kakan. I will be your facilitator today. Uh, I am an educational sector leader uh, with Whiteman, and I'm also a recognized educational facility planner. So I'll be your host today, and if you have any questions, please use the chat box, um, and uh, Christine Kennedy uh, will help you with any kind of technical issues should you run into any. Uh, the town hall that we've created uh, called Wednesdays with White Men, uh, we put this together to provide a platform for superintendents and school uh, officials to uh, learn and become informed and ask questions and share their best practices. I know these are unprecedented times and we're being challenged with so many decisions with so little information. And that's why I'm so happy to have our guest today who's going to present and we're gonna have a discussion on how to prepare students and teachers uh, returning to school safely. And uh, this is based on the Michigan Safe Schools Roadmap. And we're gonna get some insights from Nikki uh, from a Return to School Advisory Council member. So she was there and hopefully uh, we'll have some really great insights. I also wanna to introduce today, Dr. Tom Langdon. Uh, he is a part-time superintendent and mentor for Walkerville Public Schools. He is also an educational consultant for Whiteman. Uh, so we work very closely with, with Tom and have uh, forged a really great relationship with him. And he's a great resource. Thank you. And then finally, I want to introduce uh, Ms. Nikki Britton. She is the health officer for the Berrien County Health Department. Um, she sat on Governor Whitmer's uh, COVID-19 uh, Return to School Advisory Council. She has a Master's of Public Health in, of public health in epide Epidemiology uh, from Yale University and uh, is currently uh, has been with the Berrien County Health Department, I believe, for nine years. Is that right, Nikki? 11. 11. <laughs> okay. So with that, Nikki, I'd like to uh, just turn it over to you and uh, we look forward to your presentation. Yeah, thank you so much. I, I'm honored to be here and be able to talk with all of you, share a little bit more about this experience. Um, and a lot of this goes to um, the governor when she, on June 30th, she did announce and release the roadmap. Um, but for those of you that were following along a bit more closely, in the beginning of June, this is when the governor um, set that June 30th deadline and sort of threw down the gauntlet um, and said we needed to have a decision made. We're going to get this group of people together. So it was towards um, late May, early June that there was the formation of this advisory council. Um, the governor's office was actually very specific in their request for having two local health officers um, in the two of the 25 seats on this advisory council. And I really appreciate that they were very intentional about including public health and local public health um, in that. I was selected from our State Association of Local Public Health um, departments because of my background in infectious disease epidemiology and I've done a lot more recent work um, in ACEs or adverse childhood experiences, trauma, resilience, and equity. And COVID-19 really uh, demonstrates perfectly how all of those different things um, are caught up in each other, bound up together, and also exacerbate one another and are inextricably linked. So I, I 
have some of that background that they were really looking for from public health. So I believe that is why I was selected to be um, on this um, council. Um, so as I said, it was early June when we were given this task of creating this roadmap or providing advice for the creation of this roadmap. So we had about a solid three and a half weeks to bring together um, the 25 members of the advisory council along with some other staff members um, to do this work. Now there was also a uh, return to schools task force that was comprised of some higher level state officials, members of the governor's cabinet, other um, state state employees. And really where they had gotten us to where our work started was responding to some documents that they had created that um, really were just kind of a mismatch of let's, let's pull some things here, let's do this. Um, it was kind of the quintessential, if you ask a committee to draw a horse, you get a camel. Um, that's how the documents started. And that's okay because a rough draft to work from was fantastic. Uh, but so our team, the advisory council met um, two to three times a week for that three and a half week period um, for multiple hours at a time. And then we had homework because it wouldn't be about schools if there wasn't homework. So we were really responding to these drafts, responding to work that had been pulled together from subject matter experts um, and even experts outside of the state of Michigan that had been brought on as consultants overseeing a lot of this process. Um, so we spent a lot of time responding to that information, providing that advice. Ultimately, decisions about the roadmap did rest with the governor. We were truly advisory, and it, it really wasn't a two-way communication. We were feeding lots of advice and response um, up to the governor's office, um, and, and that's how it was designed to be. Um, one thing I, that I think is really important to note um, and made me really pleased and, and feel satisfied with the work that was done was the fact that there was really a lot of intentional space um, within the group for disagreement. And there was a lot of um, opportunity to really drill down on why there were divergent opinions so that we could get to the best result. I firmly believe that healthy conflict gets to the best end result. And there certainly was healthy conflict. I don't feel like we got caught up in group think, which often happens in these sorts of situations, especially in such a short time frame. So I feel really proud that this work does represent a diversity of thought um, and was really respectful and intentional in including that, that diversity of thought. That also means not everybody agrees with every aspect of the roadmap. There are certain things I would have chosen to do different, um, but I think it definitely represents that consensus. And ultimately, we're, we are um, not responding to a really perfect situation here. Nobody wants to be in the middle of a pandemic. None of us want to be here. We're all just trying to make, um, make our way through it. And another key thing that I think is really important is that uh, the advisory council really looked at um, the health and well-being of children from a very holistic approach. COVID-19 is not the only thing impacting the health of our children. It's not the only thing impacting the health of our communities. And it's a really important one right now. And it's a new threat and it's a somewhat undefined threat um, by virtue of being new. But there's many other things out there that need to be considered. And that's why there was a bit of a bent towards um, from the advisory members to let's try to make in-person instruction an option to the extent possible. We want to, we really want to push to make that happen um, again to the extent possible, not in a rec reckless way, but really recognizing those benefits of in-person instruction. Um, so the um, there were some critical issues that needed to be addressed. You've probably seen these in the roadmap, but we really wanted to provide that input to inform the processes of returning to school, um, ensuring that smooth and safe transition back to school. Um, and again, being advisory to the governor um, and that task force, giving them our information on the ground, um, and then really developing the recommendations um, regarding the, the return to school. Um, there were some other principles um, that we really held for our planning. Um, and I, in case you're a process person and really wanna know how we came to this, our five guiding principles as a team were to be transparent, really acknowledge what we do know and what we don't know, um, to be equitable. So really having that focus on equity, recognizing not all students have access to the same resources 
and that we don't want to widen any inequities that already exist. Um, and then the third one was to listen and that we really wanted to hear the viewpoints from our, our stakeholders and come up with creative solutions. Um, number four was to put safety first and really be focused on what the science data and the public health expertise says. Um, and then that we will be decisive. And that last one was pretty important because we could spin our wheels for six months trying to figure out the best way to operate schools in a pandemic. We just don't have that kind of time. Um, so we were pretty deliberate and intentional about making those tough choices. So just to give you some of that background. Um, but the, the meat of it is the roadmap. And then where do we go from here? Um, so the safe, um, the roadmap, and I apologize if I stumble over some of this because everything starts with my safe or my start and it, <laughs> the language gets a little confusing. Um, but so the, the, the roadmap is really based on the my safe start plan which um, really emerged, I believe, in late April, early May. And this is what the governor has been using to describe where we are as a state. And then we're also tied to our economic phases of being open um, are tied to this plan. So much of the state of Michigan um, is in either is in phases four or five. The Upper Peninsula and that Traverse City region that you're seeing on the map, those are areas that um, are in economic phase five. The rest of the state is economic phase four. What you'll note on this map, which is at the My Safe Start or the My Start map, um, where anybody can go look up epidemiological data about um, COVID 19 and how it's faring in your region or in your county, this map has the same six um, levels that we saw previously on, on the My Safe Start. Plan. However, this is indicating risk category. It's not talking about um, which phase you're in. So in-person instruction is allowed in phase four. You'll notice the Grand Rapids region here is red, which indicates high risk um, associated with number two. They're still in phase four and in-person instruction is still allowed. This is just showing where the data is trending. The governor's decisions as to which phase each region is in is not strictly tied to just the data. The data drives it, but there's an ability to factor in other information there as well. So I know that that's a point of confusion, especially as more superintendents are trying to really track the data to see where we're going to be in a few weeks. Um, this is a good tool. It's not the only one and it's not indicative of what phase we're in. Uh, so we can move to the next slide. Um, so this is, um, talking about just some things I've already said here. Um, phase four is in-person instruction. Phases one through three would require an all virtual, um, an all virtual learning environment. Everybody minimally is at four right now, but a lot of the data is trending not in the right direction. You're probably seeing in your local communities that case counts and case positivity are creeping up. Uh, so these next few weeks are going to be really important to watch. Um, phase four is probably the most pivotal in the roadmap because it does allow for in-person instruction, but it has the most stringent health and safety practices that are required. Once we get to phase five, um, everything that was happening in phase four is still strongly recommended to keep in place, but it no longer becomes required. So. I think back in June, there was some optimistic thinking that by September, we were gonna be in phase five, so the phase four mandates wouldn't even matter. Um, that was wishful thinking, and I, I sincerely doubt that that would be the case moving forward. But I don't have a crystal ball, so um, there's that. So let's go to the next slide. So one of the things that I think is wonderful about the roadmap is that there's a lot of local decision making and lots of room for locals to respond to what's going on on the ground. Um, but sometimes that local decision making is both a blessing and a curse. It's great to have some of that autonomy, but then there are times where you just want to know what to do because we don't really know what to do exactly um, at the local level. So there were some um, parts in the roadmap where the mandate, the requirement, is to consult with your local health department. Uh, and so as local health departments, we've been spending a lot of time 
um, trying to gain some alignment um, so that there is not a whole patchwork of really different things going on across uh, the state in different ISDs and in different areas. Uh, but we're working through making sure, you know, how we all respond to a positive case in a school environment is very similar. Because if in one health jurisdiction, everything completely shuts down, and in another, it's just merely a bump along the way and we just keep going like nothing happened. I mean, those are two very far end of the extremes, um, but you wouldn't want that inconsistency. That's challenging for students and parents. Um, so the health departments have definitely been um, working with each other as well as with our local schools to make sure we're all in step and taking into account the local factors while still remaining true to some, some higher, more evident truths. Um, something else that's in the roadmap is to be sure to be um, connecting weekly with your local health officer to understand the situation. As superintendents, you are being asked to make a lot of decisions and lead your district through some really um, difficult waters. Your local health officer is there to be with you during that and make sure you have all of the context and the information that you might need as you're making those decisions or trying to explain those decisions. So. Most local health departments and most school districts have really um, good working relationships. We work together on other types of infectious diseases. It's just not usually to this scale and this magnitude, but we have those things. Um, you can see here on this slide, there's a number of things that we look at to assess how our, a community is doing in terms of COVID transmission. It's real easy to get fixated on positive cases. Um, but that is probably the number that you should put the least amount of stock in. It's important to watch, but that can be so subjective um, based on testing strategy and test availability. Really watching the percent positive, how the hospital's doing, um, deaths, all of those sorts of things with the additional context of is this being driven by one cluster or is it much more community spread, all of that really matters. So I encourage you to continue to stay in, in discussion with your um, local health department. Uh, next slide. So the roadmap. I am um, certain that all of you are very familiar with this document um, and that you've spent a lot of time trying to figure out what questions it answers for you um, and which questions remain unanswered. Um, just as that high level overview, as I said, phases one through three, that's really where we're seeing widespread transmission of the virus. And uh, the, the governor has deemed that this is not an appropriate time to have schools operating in person. But the, um, it's very important that instruction continues. I know you are all committed to the, um, in the learning of our students, I was absolutely amazed what teachers were able to put together and schools were able to put together for virtual learning back in March when there was essentially 36 hours between the time it was announced to the time school was dismissed. Um, so there, there's a lot to be said. Virtual learning is not perfect. It does not replace in-person, especially for, or not for all students and not at all grade levels. But I, again, working through this pandemic is making do with the reality that we have. Phase four is where we're all really focused right now because that's what the majority of the students in the state are, are at in gearing up for um, what in-person instruction might look like. Um, phase four really depends heavily on some health and safety practices. Um, and this is a very simplistic rendering uh, of a way to think about this. Um, but I've been really encouraging my superintendents as you're thinking about, because we can't cover every scenario in any sort of guidance. In, in some ways, we need you to have a bit of a framework to be able to make some decisions and figure out what's best on the spot um, and get your staff in, in similar situations. So I look at some of our, our big three protective measures uh, sort of as a triangle here. So we've got cohorts uh, in one corner. We've got face coverings in another and social distance on another. And anytime you can have all three of these in place, that reduces the risk the most. So if everybody's wearing face coverings, you've got social distance and you've got cohorts where it's repeated people around each other all at the same time. All of the contacts are the same day in, day out. There's some routine and predictability to that. That is going to reduce risk 
And it's also going to make it so that if there are people who do become ill, that's going to happen no matter our, our best intentions, some people will still become ill. With the cohorting, that really helps minimize the number of people that were exposed. But so at any given time, having all three of these in place is great. But we're really focused on in-person instruction because there's a benefit to that. And anytime we're looking to try to get that benefit, there's a risk benefit ratio. And so there are going to be times where you're going to have more benefit from your instruction with a little bit of risk by not having all three of these in place. Social distance is a, is a, and face coverings is a great example, especially how that is in the roadmap for um, K through five. So K through five, if students are cohorted, um, and I think that we automatically think about that as if their classroom is just staying together. Cohorting can mean many things, we'll get to that. But if they're cohorted, they don't have to wear face coverings because we're leaning on the cohort for protection because we feel like there's benefit to having the students in the classroom um, without their face coverings. And you will, we'll see some of that um, in education, especially at those lower levels. We also know social distance can't be maintained in many classrooms, given the actual structure of the building and the furniture. And it's not practical to completely reinvest in different individual desks. I mean, for years, educators have moved towards collaborative learning around tables to go reinvest in desks right now, not feasible. So leaning on some of these other things is really important. Um, and just like in, older students, um, six through 12, they're gonna be wearing their face coverings. Social distance could represent some similar problems in, in a classroom setting. Um, how can you introduce cohorting into that? So if you don't have social distance, you've got face coverings in court. It's really about where in the triangle can, can you lean? Um, and just another word about um, cohorts. I think we can think really creatively about what cohorts are and Ultimately, again, like I said, cohorting is about trying to reduce the number of people that are in your six foot bubble. Because if an individual becomes ill, the health department is going to start almost building concentric rings around an individual of who was in their six foot bubble for 15 minutes or more. And so if we can minimize as school leadership, you can minimize the number of people that is in any given student's six foot bubble then that is going to be that fewer people that might be quarantined or exposed to actually becoming ill um, if somebody is sick. So this can be assigned seats in classroom, assigned seats on the bus, the same line order when you're going through the cafeteria line, if you do it that way and don't have food delivered to classrooms, um, the same line order when you're getting a drink at the drinking fountain. Um, it could be in the secondary level creating teams within grade levels. You might not be able to have the same, you know, group of 20 students take all the same classes throughout their whole schedule throughout the day, but could they be in 10 and 10? Um, or could you have groups of, you know, 50 to 100 within your high school that are all interacting with each other instead of all 1,000 interacting with each other? So it's thinking somewhat creatively about how can we use cohorting at every level to minimize who is in each other's six foot bubble. All right, let's go to the next slide. Um, phase five, we really wanna adopt all of the same things in phase four. Um, I think the biggest thing that schools will want to consider peeling back just because of sheer annoyance and um, just acceptance of it from the community is probably face masks. It might be a really um, uphill battle for a school district that is not required to mandate students wear face masks to do that in phase five. Hey, um, yes. Um, excuse me, but we do have a question um, about face masks actually from one of our guests. Would you mind taking that on right now? Sure. Is it okay. uh, 20 minutes with a mask, but within six feet? Yes. So, um, Generally speaking, because with the cloth face coverings, whether you're wearing a covering or not, if you're within six feet for 15 minutes per CDC guidance, you're considered a close contact. So even if you're masked, you are going to come up as a contact in contact tracing. Your chances of becoming ill are very low. Um, and depending on certain extenuating circumstances and what the mask was and what the contact was, the health department may make a determination about quarantine. But in general, cloth face coverings will not preclude you from being a contact if you're in that six foot bubble for the 15 minutes. 
there's just not a lot of quality control on masks. So having a, a two or three layer mask with a filter on it or an N95 or a surgical mask if it's worn really well um, versus a bandana that's just tied around and you've got it all hanging upside with a thin piece of fabric. So um, the, the guidance doesn't preclude you if you're wearing a face covering. There is some room for some um, judgment from a local health department. That's Thanks great information. Coming. Thank you. Um, so phase five, um, really continue to keep the same things. Phase six is, um, frankly, going to be a ways out. Um, I, I know that when this first started back in March and April, there was a lot of hopeful thinking that by fall, we'd maybe be back to quote normal. Um, but I, the reality is we have no way out but through, and the through means getting to levels of herd immunity while trying to minimize the amount of deaths that happen along the way. Um, so delaying and slowing transmission until we have a vaccine is the best way to get us to herd immunity while minimizing the amount of deaths. There's pros and cons to all of that. Um, and when we're talking about risk benefit, it's not appropriate to think only about COVID risks and COVID benefits. There, there's all other things. Um, so some of the other things that have really been weighed um, by the advisory council, and I know by all of you and by us, um, things like youth suicide, the amount of child abuse and neglect um, that has increased as, stu as students have been spending more time at home and without other supportive adults in their life every day. Um, we've been dealing with a, an adolescent mental health crisis in this country for years, and now we've added social isolation and frankly, really stressed out adults everywhere kids turn. Um, so there's a lot of those, those things. And we know we have a, um, an, a continuous um, achievement in equity and education in equity with dis between disinvested schools um, and those in more affluent communities. There, there's a lot of these things that really have to be um, taken into account. There's also with the re economy reopening, it's really challenging for workers to be engaged and productive in the workforce or even just in the workforce when schools are not open, when childcare centers are not open. Um, so there's a lot of that that um, really matters. Um, there, there was some research that came out of the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine that really went um, and demonstrates a lot of those other non-COVID things as well. Um, the American Academy of Pediatrics has some similar statements, just really talking about the value of in-person instruction um, for students and all of the benefits that having schools open and available really um, makes a difference. Now, this doesn't mean in-person instruction at all costs. I'm not necessarily an advocate for in-person or else. Um, I think we do need to make that decision and there's probably gonna come a time in that risk benefit ratio where it might make sense to go to virtual um, full time. But there are three scenarios that schools should be prepared to go to virtual. That's gonna be if we change phases. So if we move back to phase one, two, or three, um, an individual student could be quarantined at any given time. You have no idea at the drop of a hat, you're gonna have a student that's going to be excluded from school for up to 14 days because they, they're being quarantined due to an exposure. Where you might have to have a, a temporary closure of a school building while investigating a cluster. Um, and that doesn't mean one case equals you close the school building, but those sorts of things could be happening and they're going to happen at the drop of a hat. You're not going to have advance notice um, really that that's happening. So important to, to keep all of that um, in mind. Another thing that I guess I just really want to frame too, um, based on some of the things and information that I, I got probably 2,000, 2,500 emails from parents across the state of Michigan uh, after being named to this advisory council who were just really, um, had strong opinions about CDC guidance for schools and how that would impact their children and their decisions about whether or not to send children to school. And I think it's really important for us all to keep top of mind that as adults and as leaders, we really set the tone for our children. Uh, I empathize with everybody. I'm right there at the top of the list. I don't want this pandemic to be happening. 
I don't like the disruptions to my life. I don't like the disruptions to my family. I don't like how difficult it was to get groceries for a few months. Like, I don't like that I'm working 15 hour days every day. There are a lot of these things that we just don't like. I don't like wearing my mask either. It's really, it is uncomfortable. My glasses are fogging up. I haven't been able to get to the eye doctor because of COVID, I'm out of contact. Like we all have our own annoyances with this, but it, it's really important that we set the tone for kids. Kids are so resilient and we can look at this as an opportunity to teach our children resilience. We can teach them how to get through adversity. This is going to be a two-year blip, in my prediction. It's going to be a two-year blip in human history. We're gonna settle back into another normal. We're gonna look back on these times in five, 10 years um, and we're going to say we got through that and look at how we changed things for the better. And I think that reframe from the educational community, that reframe for parents and the encouragement for parents to be having conversations in that manner with their kids is really important. Um, we've got some pictures here of just like what school might look like when students are wearing masks and socially distanced. It's not that different. It's not like our students are going to be in the classroom um, saying, well, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. I don't know where I am. It's not going to be that disorienting. Is it going to be ideal? No, it's going to be uncomfortable, but this is what school is all about. It's not about necessarily the, the rote instruction. It is about the learning and growing and developing. So I, I'm encouraged. I think we've got a lot of really great school leaders across the country that are really going to help bring us into this new normal um, help shape what this could look like and that we can and will come out stronger on the other side. We just have to believe in the resilience of our children. Nikki, thank you so much for that. And uh, I think we can probably just take a couple of questions, Tom, and then yeah. uh, we'd like to just maybe break into uh, smaller groups. We, we, we do have a question here uh, from uh, Heather, and it's, what do you recommend to do to keep any kids or staff confidential that do have to be quarantined? Yeah, that's an important consideration. And I think it will be, I think it might be challenging, especially in some school settings. Like if somebody's gone or certain people are quarantined, they're gonna know who it was from. But it is very important that schools minimize the number of people that actually know names. Um, because there will need to be some name sharing between the health department and the school to make sure that we've identified all the appropriate contacts. But mm -hmm. there should be, you know, maybe three or four people at most in a, in a school building that know who is impacted to maintain that confidentiality. And yet yeah, there could be some assumptions um, from those around them, but it's really important that we remain trusted and credible by holding that information confidential. In another question is, um, you know, a lot of people are hearing about maybe the vaccine getting uh, approved by January or February, possibly. Do you think that with the vaccine approved at that time, and it's a successful vaccine, could that two-year blip be shortened, or do you still think it's going to have to have the vaccine go through its course a season or two? Um, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that, I mean, that is interesting. And I have not been um, studying the, the vaccine development in a ton of detail to speak to. Um, if there is a vaccine that is available in January or February, there's still going to be a lot of organizational feats in just the mass vaccination. Health departments are prepared for this. We did it all in 2009, for those of you that were around for um, H1N1, we, we, we did all that. Um, honestly, I think our biggest issue right now is people who will not want the vaccine because they're fearful of it and fearful of the process with which it was made. Um, and in this time of social media amplifying all sorts of messages, the information landscape is incredibly confusing. Um, and I'm hearing a lot already of people saying, well, I'm not taking that vaccine and here are all the reasons why. I, we've heard a lot about that from parents actually. Are you gonna require students to get the vaccine if it comes out and those kind of questions, which, you know, it's hard to answer right now. We just say, let's, let's take one day at a time right now and, and we do the best we can with what we have, right? Right, and usually those vaccine mandates do come from the state legislature or and there's some rulemaking with MDHHS um, under that. So I don't think that individual districts will be in a position to where they will need to um, come up with a mandate and then back that decision. Right, it's gonna come from somebody uh, at a higher grade for sure, yeah. yeah. 
Okay, I don't see, oh, maybe I do see another question here. Um, okay, this is from um, Donald. How do you contend with people who absolutely deny the fact of this virus that masks are malarkey and all the other that we hear a lot? Yeah, so I mean, public health has a lot of experience in dealing with this um, with vaccine exemptions as well. So over the last couple of years, anybody seeking a vaccine exemption has had to come to the health department for education. Um, we generally just try to be really respectful and empathetic of somebody, understand where they're coming from. Um, at the same time, I sort of personally have to just sort of draw a line just for my own mental sanity of, I can't use facts and reasoning to bring somebody to a conclusion if they're not using facts and reasoning for how they got to theirs. And if we're just operating different paradigms, I think the most important thing is to try to stay in relationship to make sure it doesn't get adversarial, but to just be firm and consistent and everything we can to be credible and really focus on moving the middle because the people who are at the far extreme end of um, susceptibility to pseudoscience and, and really um, promoting that, there's a middle group of people that are like, ah, I don't know who to believe. And that's really where we should be focusing our efforts and we can get more of a critical mass um, to the other side. Great. All right, uh, I don't see any more chat questions. So if we go out of the breakout rooms and come back, we'll chat a few minutes longer and uh, finish up the show. Thanks so much, Nikki. Yeah. Okay, good. so what we're going to do now is we're gonna just uh, put everybody into a breakout room and each breakout room has a question that we'd like you guys to tackle. And we'd like you to do that for maybe about five to eight minutes and then we're gonna bring everybody back and we'll have the facilitator of that room which has already been predetermined, so don't worry. Uh, we're not gonna ask you to, to do anything other than uh, have a good conversation. Uh, to just report back just very quickly within a minute or two, and then uh, hopefully we can wrap up. And if you wanna stick around a little bit later, I think we've got Nikki till about one o'clock. Uh, she could add, also answer a few more questions. So with that, Christine, can you take us into the breakout rooms? I just wanted to thank everybody for participating today. And if we could have the facilitator from uh, group one, just give us a quick uh, report. Sure, this is Greg Monberg. Uh, I, I was in the group one group. We did have a, a couple of people with uh, perspectives that they shared. Aaron is a resource room uh, teacher in Pittsburgh and uh, Jimmy is a school board member. And uh, they both provided some information on how uh, their school districts are looking at uh, serving lunches and being able to maintain social distancing and so forth that we've talked about in the, the general session. So Jim said that uh, they have been looking to uh, how, how to serve hot lunches in the classroom. So they would be distributing the food from the cafeteria and as much as possible having kids eat in the room and they are getting some uh, special training for the food service personnel, but they do have the hot plates to be able to distribute the food uh, to the classroom uh, itself. Aaron said in Vicksburg, they're still looking at two different options at the elementary school level. Um, they still are considering whether they are going to stagger and perhaps have one grade at a time and limit the number of students in the cafeteria as they serve lunch and even potentially look at serving uh, out, outside on nice days and having kids eat out of doors. Uh, and then they're also looking at what the options are to be able to serve kids in the classroom and bring the food uh, direct to the students. Okay, Greg, thank you for that, that quick yep. recap. Uh, I was the facilitator for room two and um, as it relates to screening of student staff and guests, uh, one of the strategies uh, mentioned was to limit as much as possible uh, people coming to the school uh, in terms of guests uh, so that there's uh, there's less contact uh, in terms of students and staff. Uh, I believe it was uh, Oakland and Wayne County uh, school district representative mentioned that they've sent uh, forms home for parents to fill out and then uh, staff would have to uh, self-report and keep those records. Uh, it's just, it's one of those tough things uh, and how do you manage all of that? So Nikki, did you have anything else you wanted to add since you were in my room? 
Um, I think there were just also mentions of um, ensuring that com there's compliance with FERPA and making sure that any information that might be collected through a screening process and other records were, were kept confidential. That is correct. Okay, room number three. I believe that was you, Carl. You're muted. Thank you. Yes, it was. Uh, we had a good group. Uh, we had a union rep and teacher and a parent and board member, along with uh, Tom Langdon, the superintendent. Uh, we focused on uh, government requirements and the challenges. And I, the number one issue that uh, everybody discussed was confidentiality. How do you screen the students? How do you keep that information confidential? Um, we also touched on the need to provide transportation. Again, going back to the confidentiality, how do you monitor and assign or assign bus seats? How do you keep them in their seats? Um, what about parents taking their child's temperature before boarding? Uh, there's gonna have to be a certain level of trust if that's the direction they go. And we also touched on uh, having third party transportation provided and how will they um, factor into this. And uh, finally, uh, we talked about just the general uh, feeling of parents being divided into camps. There's, it's divisive uh, for the community. Uh, and there's concern, especially among working parents, that starting with in-person uh, learning uh, and a real fear that they're, we're going to have to go back to virtual uh, should the pandemic uh, really flare up uh, once children are back in school. Thank you, Carl. I want to thank Nikki for uh, being our special guest today and providing this information for all of us, uh, whether you have kids in school or not, or you're a board member, a superintendent, or an administrator, or parent, or teacher. Uh, we just want to thank you uh, very much for, for participating today. I think we've got about seven minutes left. Uh, for those of you who uh, want to stick around a little bit longer, uh, Nikki, if you can maybe give us another seven minutes and answer maybe some specific questions from the audience. So I would just ask that uh, you go ahead and turn your microphone on and uh, or put your hand up and then uh, we'll go ahead and turn your microphone on. Are there any questions from the audience? Or maybe George, I've got one from my breakout yeah. room, actually. Yeah, um, go ahead. Yeah, one of our participants um, says that their health department says that taking temperatures gives a false sense of security sometimes, especially for like the younger ones, because, you know, sometimes there's no evidence at all of someone actually having the virus. Um, are you seeing that as concern um, on your level or even from parents, parents telling you that, Nikki? So we, we've been pretty explicit in telling our schools that um, we're not recommending that they take temperatures because the evidence is showing that maybe only about 50% of kids that are sick have a fever. So the amount of time that it would take to take a temperature on every student and the training and the PPE that would be required for the staff person who's taking the temperatures really wouldn't generate as much value um, for the cost that it's taking. Now, if there is a school that really wants to make that happen and we're seeing more, some of our smaller private schools that really want to do that and they have ways that they could stagger arrivals and the parent is present, so dropping the child off, they're not arriving on a bus. So in that case, if a student does scan with a high temperature, they can immediately send the child home safely. That's not usually the not always the case in a public school setting where you're dealing with just larger volumes and buses. So I, I personally don't think there's a ton of value add in doing the temperature um, taking if that's something that really makes um, families feel more secure. There are some ways you can do it, but you have to put it in that context of it's not if you get a good temperature, you pose no risk or you must not be sick or infectious. And what's the word on if you aren't showing any signs of being sick but are positive, what's the risk of that person actually spreading the COVID? I know you don't have a percent, but is it pretty small? Is it? I'm not yeah. To for you, but, yeah. I, I mean, I think there's, there's continues to be emerging research about that. There was a study that came out, I believe last week that was saying that um, children under the age of 10 generally are not very infectious. 
Um, and that makes sense. I mean, as it moves from 10 to 19, they start to physiologically be more like adults and tend to be as um, infectious as adults are when infected. Don't really understand why, and we don't have a good sense of percentages. The other thing that gets complicated, and I don't want to get too technical here, but there's asymptomatic where you are infected with the virus but truly have no symptoms. Then there are people who have mild enough symptoms that it doesn't really bother them, but they actually are symptomatic. Um, and then there are people who are pre-symptomatic. So before symptom onset, there is a high enough viral load that you're infectious for about 48 hours. And you can't know where you were in that mix until all the time, like the infectious period has already passed. Because you don't know if you're pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic um, at any given time. So it becomes really tricky to do that, to, to understand that. The, the main message that we are seeing in some of the research is that younger children don't seem to be as infectious and symptomatic people tend to be more infectious, but to really quantify that risk is, is impossible right now. Um, let's see if we have any questions. I, just for my own curiosity, I guess more than anything else maybe, is the fact, why is it, do they have any theory at all of why adults are more uh, get the disease more than a lot more than children do. Is it the hormone piece, like when they turn 13, 14, maybe a little more? Is there any speculation whatsoever, I guess? So, some of what I've seen, and this is all speculative because nobody, nobody knows, but I, I have um, seen some, some research out there just kind of wondering if it has to do with the part of our immune system that's called the natural immunity in cytokines. So that's not the part of our immune system that produces antibodies that are specific to a certain um, pathogen, but the more general side of our immune system. And there might be something in how COVID is responding with that part of immune system that functions differently in children versus adults. That's just a theory. Really don't have any idea why. Um, but, but that is what we're seeing. I mean, in a lot of ways, that's really, really good news. Yeah. Is there any other disease, like any other virus like this that does um, prey more on adults than children that we're aware of? Or is this like a very novel or unique type of virus? Um, you know, I, I can't come up with an example off the top of my head. Um, that is exactly that way. I mean, usually the very young and the very old with like influenza and other types of respiratory right. viruses, you see some of that. Um, I can't think of another one off the top of my head. Well, if you can, I don't think anybody else can. So, <laughs> I mean, that's, 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 I know it's a tough question, but I, I guess I'm done with my questions. George, looks like George needs to take it back now. So uh, <laughs> thank you again, Nikki. Absolutely. Yes, th thanks again, Nikki, and thank you for all the participants. I just wanted to share with you that uh, our next town hall meeting is on August the 12th, and it will be focused on uh, student mental health. Uh, so please, if you have time, join us, and we will be posting a recap in our, in our uh, newsletter uh, next week of this particular meeting, and there will be a link if you want to access the actual video portion of the meeting. So again, thank you guests. Thank you, Nikki, uh, for participating. I think this was an incredibly informative uh, conversation and presentation today. I hope that uh, in the end, this will help each and every one of the uh, school districts that have been here and beyond. Uh, so thank, thank you, you very much. Yes, thank you so it. much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. All right. Take care, everybody. Be safe.